This week's podcast is sponsored by Marantz, who've been delivering advanced home audio innovations since 1953. Marantz audio products have been designed to reproduce music as it was meant to be heard, because music matters. Find out more about what makes Marantz so special at MarantzMoments.com. Hello and welcome to Davy Forum's podcast for Monday the 11th of November and joining me in this edition, Steve Withers. Steward, one sympathises. Ed Selly. I won't consider myself to be in trouble until I start weeping blood. Kaz Harlow. You woke me to share his holiday plans. And Mark Burright. Keep the fruit. Welcome back to the podcast. We've got a full house. I, I tried to remember the last time we had a full house on the podcast. It oh, must be quite a few months ago now. But anyway, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, before we go any further though, we're not here next week. That's maybe why we've got a full house. So we're we're taking the, the weekend off. Uh, but myself and Steve have been busy uh, in the meantime. And we've recorded the second part of our calibration uh, or our look at calibration featuring um, Steve as grumpy old man and Julian Scott who is a professional calibrator uh, and we're going to be looking at what are professional calibrators and what do they do uh, and that will be next week's podcast so the one that goes out um, next Monday and then the following Monday we're doing the end of the month because after that we're into December Jesus where has this year gone <laughs> who knows and then and then it's CES <laughs> let's see uh, right, so what's everybody been doing? Well, let's go to Mark. We haven't heard from Mark for a while. So what have you been doing every Sunday when we've asked you to come along and you've been too busy? Um, <laughs> well, prior to the clocks going back, I was still continuing with my foolishly um, deep shed base. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it didn't need to be four foot thick. I, I know that now. Um, <laughs> other than that, um, yeah, just general DIY um I have been searching, though, deep into uh, kind of the depths of Google image search to try and find a period skirting board. And that is a, as exciting as it sounds. Any luck? Ha- no, no. It's it's incredibly annoying. In this kind of era, you you would think, like, you've, you've got 3D printers, you've got specialized businesses, but trying to find a particular type of skirting board when you've got the entire room done, but you just need a two-foot section of something that matches from about turn oh, of the century put, uh, or something. Put something in front of it so you can't see that oh, gap. Oh, thank you very much for that. <laughs> Being f***ing <laughs> sweet, Steve. Would it not work? <laughs> okay, oh, this this may be as dumb as Steve's, but is it not worth sacrificing a tiny section of the existing skirting board and then just going to a carpenter slash woodworker and getting it matched? Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, yes, but there's the, always that feeling that you're going to find some kind of a solution. And what and what I've come up with now is I've got an understairs cupboard, and I reckon I can pinch some of it from inside that. Ah, recycling, I like that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's that's my fun weeks, Phil. That was definitely keep you busy weeks. over the dark dark nights. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. I mean, I bought a new circular saw. I mean, that's exciting. But you know, that's a bit late for Halloween, isn't it? <laughs> did, you have it did you have it for Halloween? No, no, oh. I, no, I didn't actually. And there, it, uh, Halloween is very annoying around here because I, I had assumed that kind of there was lots of trick or treaters, but then when you come up with kind of scary ideas, you suddenly realise that in fact for the first hour they're all like about four years old, exactly, being brought yeah. around with their parents, and then you just suddenly think, you know, I, how am I supposed to scare? You know, you've got like four year old Thanos stood there in front of you, and you think, yeah, the fake blood on the window probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes it's a it's a balancing act in the same way that you know um working out at what point you stop answering the door in the evening because oh, yeah. it moves to people who are wearing a 10p mask and would prefer money quote oh, so yeah, yeah. There was, there was at like, the end of the evening are just feral there's a great there's a great one on facebook the uh the local chippy around here came up with this brilliant idea that any kids that went in in fancy dress got free chips <laughs> and he kept posting photographs and as the night went on the costumes just got shitter and shit <laughs> until, <laughs> until it was teenagers who had obviously just gone to the local spa or whatever and bought a mask and just <laughs> shoved the mask on so they were getting free chips <laughs> well, well you said see- chippy I thought you meant a carpenter <laughs> <laughs> no working class Steve you mean a purveyor of fish and the chips <laughs> I've come dressed as a middle-aged man whose dreams have been shattered. <laughs> <laughs> Give me free chips. <laughs> uh, Ray, Kaz, what have you been doing? 
Well, we had uh, an eventful fireworks night yesterday because the fireworks fell over. Ooh. So I chipped down with my kids, and it's an event here. So so people come uh, from from like 20 miles away, which doesn't seem far, but we're only in a village just to see the fireworks here. So we must have had, I'm guessing, about 500. And it's organized locally to support the local school. So it's a, a really nice thing. They do a massive bonfire and some fantastic people. fireworks. <laughs> yeah. Stop it. So... See- the fire will go off, and two minutes into them, and they're scaring the hell out of my son, so I'm not really paying attention because he's sitting there going too loud, too loud, too loud. And my wife goes, they've fallen over. And we're, we're far enough back, but they're still firing towards yeah, they, they the crowd, stop. who at this point are running. And uh, so we left straight away. Uh, I, I, there's, you can only rely on Facebook for what happened next, but paramedics were running past. I'm assuming just for, just in case, because I haven't heard anything about people being seriously injured. But then the police were called because, as it happens, by some crazy coincidence, people were also firing fireworks into the crowd from neighbouring fields. Like, where, I, where do you <laughs> live? They <laughs> root. <laughs> So, so uh, what are these treasured things that we've done six years in a row? And uh, I don't think it'll happen next year. Kaz, you've watched every <laughs> film ever made. Did yeah. you or did you not scream incoming as it actually started? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we, we've actually uh, found out today that Kaz hasn't seen all the film. No, every no, film. no, no it's, oh, it's, it's been yeah, out about four minutes. I haven't seen, yeah, but I, 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 I've seen every film with the words incoming in it. Did you yell it? No, I didn't. Oh. I think we're. Le- I just said we're leaving now because I-, I didn't really want to shout incoming and have <laughs> everybody the hole. around me run as well. <laughs> Medic. Yeah. I-, I want to go back to the good old days when I was a kid and we were actively encouraged to go outside, beg money off strangers and then use that money to buy explosives. Those were the days. <laughs> See, and then we built an effigy of a Catholic, Catholic um, tra- um, terrorist. So yeah, good. There, is, there is something to be said for a village firework display. Just because high explosives and amateurs trying to put that kind of thing on, you can always tell who's valued in the village as to who gets sent back to the one that doesn't go off. Yeah, I <laughs> see that in Razy though, Mark. The one on, one of the displays I had uh, when I was a kid at boarding school, they spent a lot of money on the fireworks, and one single wiring error meant that they hit the button to start the display and everything went off at once. <laughs> that, that's it was seemingly quite a common sh- thing. Shock and awe. You think there's no way they can keep this up for oh. there is there is actually footage of that happening uh, in a scottish village and they they put this thing on a boat because they thought it was safer to set the fireworks off on a boat and obviously there was this uh, a wiring uh yeah accident it was over within 10 seconds and the boat was in flames it's it's absolutely outstanding when it does happen it's just quite brief although you know depending on how cold and wet it is it, it it's you know quite timely brief unlike this podcast uh right so who was i with cars right so and i've done mark ed uh i've ordered my next car mm. sound sound the car purchasing klaxon so Steve, is, is it a hybrid or electric is it bollocks <laughs> good man <laughs> no um once again uh i i did on twitter a couple of months ago bemoaned that none of the lease companies have a slider which simply shows you what the fastest thing you can rent for any given amount of money actually is which i think is a grave oversight with how these things work however if you actually go into the office of the organization and basically ask what that question is you get some good answers back so uh it came down to a two-way tussle between the mcgann rs and the seat leon cupra uh, my garage friend who would be looking after both cars said that if I bought them again RS he'd never speak to me ever again and if he went if I went anywhere near the garage it would be mysteriously shut so that kind of tipped me towards the yeah, uh, the Leon not not, um, not so good reviews actually about the the new Megane RS so you no, made, you although it is it there. is quite an exciting thing to drive I have have had a go in it um, but it's the fact it's taken one did turn up for servicing and it took several days to locate the oil for it so that struck me as a bit weird so no the Leon in terms of the balance you get uh, I managed to rent at least a car with 290 brake for 295 pounds a month and that's the luxe version with everything on it 
so that seemed very reasonable. Yeah, yeah. well, it's just uh, it's I've just also, a, it's just another badge, Dowdy. So it is. Yeah. It's the same. Yes, yeah, that same platform. Uh, the other thing I've done, I've not made the same mistake. This one is in incredibly anonymous grey, so it will hopefully blend in a bit better when I'm not feeling up for it. So that's all. Um, no, no. Is it a Seat or is it just Cupra these days? Because I think they just changed it to Cupra, didn't they? I I don't know. I think it has a gold S on the front, which looks a bit naff, and Cupra on the back of it. But it is still very, very clearly a Seat Leon. It doesn't matter what you try. It's like Citroen with the DS thing. It's still still very much a Citroen. So um, yeah, but it, the seats are quite quite comfy. Uh, it's got. Um, I say lots of toys. It's my first automatic that I've owned. Uh, oh, you've gone for think, the, the auto box flappy paddle. I didn't, didn't have any choice. It's seven speed DSG, whether right. you like it or not. Yeah. So that's fine. Um, you'll lo- you'll love the G- DSG. I mean, it's it's not the same as a manual, but it's the best, the next best thing because uh, obviously the Volkswagen Group, it's all the same thing, and uh, it's the one I had in the S3, and uh, fantastic, really, really good. Yeah, I mean, I I I have every suspicion this thing won't be as chuckable as mm-hmm. the current car. But it will. It, it it's a little bit bigger. It's a bit more, you know, considered. Um, and yes, it does appear to be reasonably brisk. So you know, it, it should all work quite nicely. And so Steve doesn't drop off. That's fine. Otherwise, I've just been doing some further work on sorting the house out, uh, doing watching some work. Watching MasterChef. Watching MasterChef. Odds. I think Olivia might be an early contender. <laughs> Defo. Defo, yeah, and she's quite easy on the eye, which is always nice. Oh, there's always, 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 a, always a cloud. There's always that angle with Steve. Always, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, as I say, yeah, it, it, so that that's that's kicked off, and then obviously that that when we get to television, whatever that War of the Worlds thing's kicking off soon as well. So, um, oh, yeah, his, his, our materials started last Sunday. Oh, I could give us stuff about yeah, that because yeah, I never yeah. read the book. So I'm we, we, can, we can cover this. Not next week, but the week after, because we're doing our best of the month. So I'm, there's loads of good TV at the minute, so that'll be a bumper yes. episode there. Uh, what did I do? Um, uh, oh, I, um, I had a uh, Harry Bikers Chicken Ball E. I know there's chicken in it. <laughs> I'm not 100% meat-free. so um, Actually, if you were in somewhere like China, that, they would consider that to be not a meat dish. <laughs> I've, I've been in a restaurant where someone said, can I have some vegetarian option? And they, and they go, there's chicken in this. He goes... Yeah, that's, that's vegetarian. Isn't it? <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, I've had the same thing in Sligo in Ireland. So you don't need to go, you don't need to, yeah. go to Asia for that. Yeah. Or, yeah. or if you're in France, the waiter just goes, "We have meat, or you can leave." <laughs> <laughs> I actually saw a way to do that in France once. It was really funny. Yeah, good stuff. So this was in the Balti Triangle down in Birmingham. Uh, I was down there for for uh, a day and a bit just for for some meetings and that kind of thing, and uh, went out for for that. And and I've got to say, I think you went to Birmingham just for fun. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, nobody goes to Birmingham for fun, Steve. Ooh. Never. Sorry, sorry, Brummies. Um, but yeah, the food was absolutely fantastic. It was a restaurant. I'm trying to remember the name of the restaurant now, but they were featured on Haiti, Haiti Bikers. And uh, it was, oh, stunning. The best ball I've ever had. Absolutely brilliant. I uh, haven't done much else other than work, and we're going to come on to that uh, a little bit later. So that leaves me with Steve. Well, speaking as any person on this podcast who has a hobby that's actually related to AV... Uh, I spent it watching a lot of stuff on Apple TV Plus since it just launched. And there were some quite good shows. Yeah. What do you watch so, that on, Steve? I know that sounds stupid. Bizarrely, like TV? Apple TV. No, I understand, but but like, is it is it something that you can? Is it something uh, you can uh, watch any other way through your normal telly without? If you've got Samsung, you can. I think Sony also about to add the Apple TV app to their TVs, uh, oh, okay. and the Roku Roku Stick. There's so a few, uh, also uh, an Xbox One X, I think, that, or One, Xbox One, uh, will also do Apple TV. So there's quite a few devices now. Uh, but obviously the easiest way is just to get an Apple TV. And it's free yeah. for, is it a week? Ah, well, I, I have one Apple TV in the home cinema, and I decided to get a second one for the lounge. So slow so, down. We're going back to this for, for me. So I can't do it, can I? What, do, what have you got TV-wise? LG, um, isn't it? Yes. Anything else? Not yeah. around the house? Uh, sources <laughs> no that's it okay. so there's Currently, no, no options no but I should imagine if Sony Kaz, Kaz it, you, you don't need it mate you watch enough TV you do enough <laughs> TV <laughs> there, there, that is true actually <laughs> um, yeah no I ordered a second Apple TV and it arrived so I ordered it on Saturday and it arrived on Monday plugged right. it in set it all up 
And I was like, where's my... Because be, it says on the website, if you if you order certain products, of which Apple TV is one of them, you get uh, a year subscription for free, which is basically worth 50 quid. So it's, it's 4 a month or 50 quid for the year. So I thought, I'll get an Apple TV for the lounge, 50 quid sorted. So basically I've paid £125 for the for the um, Apple TV in, or, or I've got the or I've got the Apple TV Plus for free, whichever you want to look at it. So I thought, brilliant, set it up, and it still had um, my expiry date as uh, last Friday because I got the I don't know you know um, uh, trial period. So I rang them up, or well, got them to call me, should I say? And I said, uh, oh, how do I set up? The, how do I get my my year subscription? They goes, oh that that offer ended on the tenth of September. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, I think you mean it started on tenth of September. I mean the bloody um, service only started on Friday um, and, I, and I'm looking at your website right now and it doesn't say anything about that and I said so <laughs> either you give me my subscription right now or there's going to be hell to pay and they gave me my subscription but I don't know why they try to weasel the way I out of it I just love the idea of one man against Cooper T that you're just railing against those big glass doors they've got at the building <laughs> Uh, like, let's face it, it, Steve. Yes, I, I, no, I, it, it, I looked. I checked the website, every bit of it, and there was no date or anything in there. So either they are massively misleading people, or the people I was talking to didn't know a clue what they were doing. Probably the anyway, latter. Yes, they gave me my subscription, so that's sorted. Um, you make it I sound w- like you were Liam Neeson in Take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no particular skills. I won't. <laughs> it, it does sound like Liam Neeson in Take, except well, I could have done without that. Was spending an hour. On phone an hour an hour well, at least yeah. they called you they called me so it wasn't it cost me any money but it was just time you know it was an hour of my time and i was busy and i didn't really need uh, were you be... speaking for most of that hour steve yes he I, was. Uh, I wasn't yeah. i was on hold for most of it i had to actually take a screenshot on, i was on my i was actually at, wasn't at home so I'd, i had to find my email where they confirmed my order because i said they said who did you buy it from i said i bought it from you because <laughs> <laughs> you got my um apple id can't you see that you guys are always making everything connected. Um, so anyway, I had to take a screenshot of my order, email that to them so they could see I had ordered it from them. And I was like, I mean, just get on with it. Give me my damn subscription. So yeah, I took an hour of my time to get what I should have had in the first place. But um, it was done. To be fair, me. Steve, if you ever, trust me, if you ever need to cancel your 4G router, you've got a treat in store there. <laughs> <mate. Fuck. laughs> that, that, um, that, that took, I don't have a huge reserve of patience. Uh, and it, it was expended pretty quickly. It's when you've waited, oh, it was well in excess of 30 minutes to speak to someone, and then they tried to start selling me something else. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, and, and what's more, if, and uh, the only way that I got the lady to stop doing it was to say, if you try and sell me one more thing, I'm also going to cancel my iPad SIM with you out of spite. <laughs> and that was literally the only way that I was able to crack on with just cancelling the router. Yeah. Unbelievable. Shall we, uh, shall we crack on with some podcasts? I was, going, I was just going to say, uh, anyone listening to this podcast, if you have just bought an Apple product and you want to get your year subscription, they're trying to give you a hard time. Don't take any shit from them. Get your subscription. Or you're get Steve to, to call them. Up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Steve <laughs> with his it's a bit Civil Avenger. <laughs> the equaliser. <laughs> Right, competition. The AV equaliser. Yeah. I like the sound of that, actually. We've got a whole bunch of 4K disc competitions. We've got uh, It's a Wonderful Life in 4K. That's 21st of November. We've got uh, Spider-Man Far From Home on Blu-ray. That's 26th of November. Monty Python's Flying Circus Season 1 on Blu-ray, 26th of November. Wonder Woman Bloodline Steelbook. That's 26th of November. Leon Director's Cut on 4K. That's 27th of November. Win copies of two of Criterion's November titles on Blu-ray. That closes 3rd of December. Uh, lots more competitions are open or being added daily, so head over to avforums.com slash competitions to enter even more. All competitions open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. And previous competition winners, we've got uh, AB18 wins 763 up, GW78 wins American Woman... GSLC Will and Jim DeGrease win copies of The Dark Half on Blu-ray. Batfink78 got Dogs of War. Hammer Time got Rebel and the Punch and Judy Man on Blu-ray. Stop. Hammer Time. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan and Mo3733 won Dauntless, then Battle of Midway on Blu-ray. 1970 BLF won Angel Heart on 4K. You are lucky. 
Uh, Kalos got Men in Black International on 4K. You are not, not so lucky. So lucky. <laughs> Falkland got a copy of X Men Dark Phoenix on Blu-ray. Um, 4K. Uh, same Blu-ray. goes. We're, we're really sorry. The last two. Yeah, we're really <laughs> sorry, but you've got a drinks coaster. But, but, but the thing right is, side. you did enter it, so you've only got yourself <laughs> to blame. Hang on, yeah, hang on. Applying Steve logic here, they're both fantastic AV demo discs, surely, because I trust it. You own both of them, Steve. I do own both of yeah. them. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, they're okay. They're nothing special. The um, previous Men in Black films, I think, had better 4K disc releases. Right, and the Criterion November titles, because seen as I took the time to put everything in chronological order and mentioned what the films were, you didn't read out the films. I did. When copies of two of Criterion's November titles on Blu-ray, that's closes third of December. They include the Palm Beach Story. And where's Anderson's Moonrise Kingdom? Right, hardware reviews next. Okay, moving on, hardware uh, reviews. Uh, Take me go through some equipment, which is what we should be doing on these things rather than just waffling on. So, <laughs> Steve, let's waffle on. Uh, formation bar, base and flex you've been looking at these um, separately as well as a system and this continues on from what uh, Ed has been looking at as well from the Bowers and Wilkins formation lineup. remind us again what you've looked at Ed? Uh, I've looked at the Duo and I can't remember the Wedge, wedge. Uh, tri- wedge. wedge yes, you had the- yeah. that's the one so the only thing we haven't seen out of the formation suite is the formation audio, which is basically a kind of um... no. I've tested the audio; it's in, in oh. the, both the duo and the wedge reviews. So no, we've done. Oh right, done so you included it with that. Yeah, excellent. Yes, we have done all them. There you go. Yeah. yeah so I've ha- I've got the flex, which is um, a wireless speaker, and um, but can also double as as surround speakers in a five point one system. Can you use um, them as a I, stereo pair as well, Steve? Yes, you can do that. In fact, I mean, this is one of the things that's good about this system. You can use the flex on its own. You can use it as a stereo pair, and you can also use it with the bass as a as a two point one system, which I have to say sounds very good. Bit pricey, but sounds very good. So you've got the flex. Um, you've got the the bar, which is obviously the sound bar, and the bass, which perhaps not surprisingly is the subwoofer. Um, so all these are part of the formation system. Uh, they certainly, I mean, as with the products that uh, Ed's already reviewed, I'd say that they're quite attractive. I mean, the, the Flex is, uh, you know, it, it's a wireless, small wireless speaker, um, slight cylindrical shape, black fabric cover with a kind of a, a, a um, honeycomb diamond rigid uh, substructure. Same with the uh, with the bar, Which, actually. Which is, but the well, wedge, sorry, yes, the wedge, has got, wedge has got that. Yeah. Let me guess: is it for, was it as hard to photo? It looks better in yeah, the real life. It looks a lot better in the flesh than it does, than it does in any of the photos. Yeah, the bar is not dissimilar. It's kind of cylindrical as well, but where it tapers towards the ends, it's got nice little um, brushed metal end plates um, and the same kind of um, honeycomb triangular structure with black fabric over it. Um, the build quality on all the products is superb. I have to say they're really nicely yeah, made yeah, products. Yeah, yeah. They look gorgeous. Um, and and the flex on its own, I think, is a, a very capable little little um, wireless speaker. I can hear a big butt coming here. Well, yes, um, <laughs> and it's a butt that's already been mentioned in detail by Ed. But as good as these products, and this applies to all the flex product, all the sorry, all the formation products, um, they su- they only support high resolution audio if you're using Rune. Now. I have been trying. I've got, I love Rune. <laughs> I got I, there was a uh, a three month uh, voucher that comes with them. If you buy a, a formation product, you get a three month trial, and uh, I think it's fantastic. But it is about ninety five pounds. It's was it one hundred and nineteen dollars? One hundred and nineteen a year. Yeah, or four. which is about ninety five quid a year. Um, or yeah. is it monthly? Is it monthly? Yeah, no, no, no. There's just annual or annual or lifetime. That's your lot. What's the lifetime cost? Uh, four hundred, I think, something like that. It's so, um, yes, it's not cheap. So you've just spent four hundred pounds. God, that's the other thing, right? So a flex, four hundred quid, three nine nine, for a single wireless speaker. Um, if you just spent that, then you have to spend another a quarter of the price again, basically, in order to have high resolution audio. That's that's a bit of a butt. Um, you know, it's, it sounds great. It's a great little product. But when you consider you could go and get the uh, Music Cast 20, which you reviewed, Ed, the Yamaha, yeah. very similar looking, 
very similar size sounds great music cast built in which is a really good i mean i've got to say the formation app not particularly good uh, well, it's no, you very see, I, basic i would counter that it i think all it's really there to do is to help you set the product up yeah. and that it does supremely well after that it is yeah i would agree it's decorative but equally the problem is the flex is probably not the product i think Boas is probably working out that you'll be just they they i think they figured this is mainly going to be an airplay recipient or it's going to be part of a wider system where the sunk costs of rune are a different calculation because let's face it if you've already sprung for a pair of the duos rune kind of makes more sense price wise and so on and so forth so yeah no yeah because they're way more expensive and it's less less of a of a percentage of the initial outlay yeah um, I think about the flex is, is, is as good as it is. Yeah, I can't really see who's going to buy it because you know if you want a wireless speaker, there's non, a virtually unlimited number of options. Yes. Uh, and if you're just going to use AirPlay or Bluetooth, um, which you can do with these products, which is great. But you know, I mean, you can get that. You can get just sound. I think, for I less. think the, the person who's maybe going to end up with flex is somebody who's bought in higher up the, the range. I think. Yeah, yes. I mean, if, you, if you've if you're committed to the formation suite as a whole, um, and you really like it, then 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 it becomes a, a, something you can add in either as a multi-room product or as as a as part of a multi-channel product. Which brings me to the bar. Okay, this sound bar uh, has no HDMI inputs or outputs. It doesn't support anything other than Dolby Digital. Uh, as as with all the other products, it doesn't support high-resolution audio unless you have Rune. Um, does have AirPlay 2 and Spotify Connect, uh, and you can turn it into a 5.1 system using other products in the formation range. So, how much do you think it costs? Oh, it's 1,200 quid, isn't it? Well, <laughs> luckily for them, it's now 999 pounds. That's still well, got, quite a lot <laughs> for, a, for a soundbar that really doesn't do anything. I mean, essentially, this is a this is an uh, um, an active speaker <laughs> with an optical digital input. And that's about it, really. Uh, and, and AirPlay too, and obviously formation. If it you're has using it that. has got the uh, Dolby Digital decoding built in, though. Yes, it does have the Dolby Digital. Yeah, yeah. Whoopee, <laughs> Dolby Digital. Hey, <laughs> yeah. I've got to say, for a thousand quid, you're not getting a lot. And you know, when you consider you could buy the Samsung HWQATR for less than that, and that's got Dolby Atmos and DTSX and a, and a separate wireless subwoofer um, and two HDMI inputs and an HDMI output. Um, it get, it gets difficult to to recommend that. I think. I mean, I mean, it sounds great, but I, I think there's there are way better options. I mean, like I said, that that's, doesn't even include a wireless subwoofer. You can buy the base, which is again a really good product, which I'm assuming really is only meant to be used with other formation products. It wouldn't yeah. work otherwise. Um, but that's 899 pounds. So if you're looking at just doing the, the just under yeah, two nearly, nearly two grand just for a 2.1 system at Dolby Digital. You can add in the flexes for a 5.1.2 system. Um, sorry, 3.1 system with the bass because there's three channels in the um, in the soundbar. Um, if you add in the flex, then you're looking at a system that's nearly 3,000 quid. That's 2,700 to be precise. 2,700 pounds. Now you could literally buy a Denon AVR and a sound, you know, and, and a speaker package of that, or you could get the Sennheiser. Um, for less, or or you get the the Samsung Q uh, HWQ 90R, which comes you know as a full 7.1.4 channel Atmos DTS system for a considerably less, so or half the price actually in the case of the Samsung. It does sort of just factor into lead into the same things that I was saying. This is it's it's easy to admire some of the technology, some of the the cleverness at work here, but it's toppy in pricing terms. It really is. Well, I'm sitting thinking, who is the customer for this? You know, who who is it? Because if it's anybody that's higher up the food chain when it comes to Bowers and Wilkins kit, then they're not going to go down this route. Um, and I think it's a very hard... I, I wouldn't like to be the salesman who uh, is trying to sell this to somebody who's just walked in off the street and wants a, an audio system for the home. So... I'm really struggling to see where where the customer is for this. I mean, the biggest problem for me, for the sound bar, given that, as, as Steve points out, it's not exactly overburdened with sound bar style features, 
you names Muso Gen 2, it's more expensive, but my God, it does an awful lot more, and at least it's got one HDMI connection. Oh, yeah, because at, le- at least one, I think, is a bare minimum on a soundbar these days, because then you've got a CC, you've got ARC, yeah. all those other features. I mean, if you've literally only got an optical digital input, I mean, you can't do... You can do very, Also, yeah, and one other massive moan... Um, <laughs> Because it doesn't come with it. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention, the soundbar doesn't even come with a remote control. Ooh. Okay, it doesn't even come with a remote control. So you're left with having to use the formation um, app. app, which is shit, no offense, um, other than for setting up. But after that, I think it's pretty basic and not particularly great. You either have to use that, and I don't want to be getting my phone out every time I want to change the volume, or it can learn uh, the remote control of your TV as long as your TV uses an IR remote, unlike my... <laughs> RF magic remote, magic remote on my LG TV, which it would it wouldn't learn or refuse to learn. So I had to use the app every time I wanted to do anything with the with the with the um, soundbar, and that really infuriated me. That's a hell of an oversight, actually. I didn't even realise that. So yeah, yeah that, that's a tough sell. It so, uh, uh, feels entirely correct. It's interesting. I mean, as I say, it's, we've now, as you say, we've covered the whole gamut of the products. I think I've got the better end of the deal here. I think the wedge. Hmm does can do some some things which it, it genuinely is able to keep the music second generation honest for less money and if you happen to already have a rune subscription anyway it closes the gap and or a, a year subscription to rune still brings it in under the price of the name the duos are the most intrinsically bows and wilkins of the products i mean they're expensive and i absolutely are some, love them i, I love them but uh, it does look like Steve's being given the um, the reheated <laughs> section of the uh, of the menu. Uh, I didn't. I mean, I have to say, I didn't realize the soundbar has no remote. That's just that's really not joined up thinking at all. No, I but, like Phil says. I, I have no idea who this soundbar is aimed at. Yeah. Other than someone who doesn't know what, <laughs> who's never seen a soundbar before. Um, yeah. I mean, there are. It's such a competitive market, the soundbar market. There are so many options, uh, and there's some really good ones. Um, that that I, I mean, it would be it would be impossible to recommend this because I just think you, you there are better options for less money. Now, um, to, to be fair though, Bowers have asked for feedback on this on on this kit, and and they do listen. Um, so in that respect, Steve, what can they add to the product that does make it useful? Well, I mean, as a bare minimum, I would expect HDMI. Because if you at least have an HDMI, one HDMI connection, then you can do ARC from your TV, and you have CEC control as well, which is handy. Um, but if you're talking about a thousand pounds, I mean, you have to be supporting immersive audio at that price point. And the problem is, I mean, it's easy to understand what the problem is, which is that this, you know, Bowers and Wilkins are a very good speaker manufacturer, and what they've built is a very good active speaker, three-channel active speaker. Um, but what they have not built is a very good soundbar. So they're looking to build a soundbar. They need to. They need to go look at some of the competition. You know, they need to look at an LG or a Samsung soundbar, and look at what they're doing with their soundbars at the same, same price point. Um, you know, because if you're asking for a, th- a, a thousand pounds with something that doesn't have a separate what separate um, it's, quite, it's not bad in terms of base performance, but you know, it's nowhere near anything that's got a separate wireless sub. So you've got no separate wireless sub, no HDMI inputs, no remote control, really. I mean, and no immersive audio support. Then then you are onto a highway to nothing, really. Yeah. So you need to, I mean, at the very least, if you're going to sell a soundbar for a grand, you've got to put an HDMI connection on there and you've got to give them a remote control. Okay. So um, they'll be getting a recommended badge then, are they? <laughs> <laughs> well, the flexors I can recommend, I mean, that's a cracking little speaker. And I did think it sounded great and I really enjoyed using that. My only, my only moan would be, like, as with the rest of the range, you, know, you have to buy a room subscription. But otherwise, it's, it's a really good little wireless sub. Sorry, it was a really good little wireless speaker, but yeah, when we come on to the to the bar, it, I couldn't recommend that to anyone. I just it just it makes it makes no sense to me as a product. Yeah, and the subwoofer. Subwoofer sounds excellent. It's a really really good sub, but again, it's like it's nine hundred quid. I mean, if you want a sub, go and get a BK for three hundred ninety nine quid. Mm-hmm. You know, and it will sound better, frankly, and it's a lot cheaper. Um, you know, it looks pretty, but. Um, yeah, it's it's again, it's it's just form over function to a certain bit, form over formation, <laughs> formation over function. Shall I say? It would be, which I thought Ooh. that for the reviewer. I wish I, th- oh, I might change the title. Yeah, go and change it. <laughs> this is, a great, this <laughs> is the beauty, the beauty of publishing. Formation for the web. over function. Yeah, I'm putting it yeah, in right yeah. now. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, they been, I think they've been proved, but they, uh, they certainly haven't been published yet, so you've got the time to do that. Right, let's move on to a network streamer from a company I, I, I have not heard of before, Ed. So tell us all about it. No, that's completely fair. Uh, it wasn't a company that I had had much dealings with until comparatively recently. Uh, I'm going to try and keep this brief. We are over time, and this is something where reading the review will get you all of the way to where you need to be. Uh, this is from a German company called Lindemann, and they have decided to celebrate their 25 years in business by building some affordable components to celebrate. Now, I need to be very clear on this. Lindemann's, <clears throat> excuse me, Lindemann's normal products cost many thousands of pounds. So affordable for Lindemann means under a grand, and that's about as far as it's going to go. They've built these tiny little metal boxes, which are called the Lime Tree series, and the one that I've brought to the attention of AV Forums, because uh, I think it does have many virtues, is called the Network, imaginatively enough, and it is a tiny, self-contained network streamer. Uh, now, the reason I think this is quite an interesting product is twofold. The first is in its own right, it has a nice operating system. It's very pleasant to use. It's got um, support for Tidal, Cobuzz, the high-res audio specialist service, Deezer, Spotify Connect, all built in. Um, if you want to suddenly turn it into a CD player as well, you can attach a USB PC uh, CD-ROM drive to a USB connection on the back and use the decoding in there as well. So if you're moving into network audio, it's even got a solution there. All of this is sort of something that rivals can do. The reason why it costs £895 for a tiny metal box is that inside that little metal box is some truly astonishing decoding hardware. It's got two DACs from a Japanese company called AKM. They are extremely high quality. They are extremely expensive to buy. Um, the long and the short of it is that uh, Lindemann would like, would prefer you to use it where it takes every piece of incoming material, regardless of sample rate and, um, uh, and what you've sent it to as, and it will turn it into DSD. That's what they want you to do with it. Now, I've been quite sus um, you know, sceptical of some of the benefits of DSD. Some of the things that people say that DSD can do, it's just fiction. It, it, it's it's just a different way of encoding a digital signal. It's not magic. However, AKM, the company that makes the DAX, they are DSD specialists. And I will say quite comfortably, this is one of the very nicest digital products that you can buy for under £2,000. Honestly, the first streamer I can think of that genuinely is a step up from this and even then it's only a little step up is the name nd5 xs2 which is 2300 pounds so you aren't getting a particularly spectacular box but it can do some extraordinary things and as i say in the review if you are someone if you've got a good high-end multi-channel system and you're bumping into the limits of what your av receivers on board streamer can do Adding something like the network, it's going to take up no space. And honestly, the levels of performance that you can potentially unlock with it are, are very substantial. And um, what's more, again, because Lindemann aren't stupid, it's completely Rune compatible as well. Um, so if you are a Rune user, just switch it over to that and you can enjoy Rune. You don't need to change any of the upsampling settings in Rune. The Lindemann just cracks on with it itself. And it's absolutely sublime. I mean, I've got no shortage of really good sounding digital products here, but I had no difficulty listening to spending a lot of time listening to the network. It's a dinky product. It doesn't look anything special. It's, you know, it's almost certainly a brand you haven't heard of, but my God, it is absolutely fantastic. Good stuff. So like Ed says, uh, the review should be up probably towards the end of this week if you're listening to the podcast in the week that we uh, publish the podcast. Right, so I'm just going to quickly round up on some of the TV stuff uh, that we're looking at. So the reviews have gone up for the C9 from LG. Um, reason why it's been so late is it's been a long term of this one so to have it as a long term I had to wait on uh, the sample coming in and obviously that sample had to go around other reviewers first of all so uh, I have had it a while now 
and it's another cracking TV from LG. It's really, really nice TV. And I reviewed that at the same time as having the 2950 in for review. So I published my GZ950 review the same week as the C9, um, which is fortuitous because they're basically the same TV, really. Um, the One does one thing slightly better than the other. Each has their own little pros and cons. Go read the reviews for that. But um, in terms of quality, very, very similar. I've also got a E9 here from LG for review. It just turned up um, just before the weekend there. Um, my God, what? <laughs> That's the most complicated TV stand I have yet set up. Because um, it's one of these where it flo- It looks like it's floating in air. So the TV doesn't look like it's on a stand. There's a little glass strip at the bottom uh, that, that stands the front end. And then you've got to add this the rear section onto it. But the rear section is really, really heavy <laughs> and it's really, really fiddly and you've got to put the screws in at an angle as well. And um, it took me about twice as long as it normally takes me to set up a TV to get that up and running. Uh, but again, another really nice TV and uh, I think the only real difference is that the E9 looks a little bit cleaner in terms of uniformity at the low end. So on a 5% slide, it looks a little bit more uniform. It looks very much like the 950, the GZ950 from Panasonic, whereas the C9, um, I did notice a little bit of the banding uh, and stripping uh, on a 5 That is the only difference I've been able to find so far. Uh, so two reviews that are up. Um, I've also just done a review of the Q60R from Samsung. So that's their entry-level QLED TV. And just going through that quickly, it is a £849 TV for the 55 inch. It's an LED LCD, edge lit VA panel, 120 hertz panel. Um, input lag was 14 milliseconds, goes up to 24 milliseconds if you use the gaming features like Game Enhancer and so on. It was fairly accurate out of the box in terms of grayscale. Unfortunately, it has an S curve gamma, which you can't get rid of, um, which did spoil things because. Uh, basically an S-curve gamma is where they clip the blacks to make things look really black and then brighten up the highlights and it gives the image a bit of a pop. I can understand Samsung doing that at this price point because this is the type of TV that uh, is not really for uh, movie. Yeah, I calibrated one yesterday and discovered that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's not really for movie viewing. It's more for somebody who's going to sit in front of the TV, probably gaming, and for uh, a normal living room with living room lighting. You don't watch it with the lights dimmed down. They actually this, had it in their bedroom, which I thought was not a bad choice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good choice. Um, other, other things like uniformity, when you put a, a 100% white field up, the edges are all dark around a bit of the screen and brighter in the middle obviously edge lighting there's nothing you can do about uh, an edge lit TV and with HDR um, you get light bleed into the bottom and the top black bars uh, with it's script films. 500 nits anyway there so it's not massive uh, yeah I'm just looking for my nits where is my nits I think it was <laughs> on me head um, the nits were 450 odd yeah uh, 480 I think I measured it at. So. yeah well, that's that's exactly the same thing because you're talking thirty nits. You're not going to notice thirty nits. Um, yeah, it's uh, it it's an edge lit TV, um, and they've added it into the QLED line. But actually, the Q7ER, um, which is a fold TV, has just dropped to under a thousand for the fifty-five inch. So, uh, given the fact there's there's less than two hundred pound difference, I'd be going with the Q70R rather than the Q60R. It's it's built to a price point. It's very plasticky the build quality, because mm. um, obviously, and it's the first TV I've seen in a while that had a bezel. Because <laughs> <laughs> ev- everything's yeah, it is quite retro. Although I, I did like the char the dark charcoal finish was quite nice from a distance. It made it look more expensive than it actually was because when you get up to it and actually handle it, it's very light and very plasticky. Um, but yeah, it, unfortunately, its its main competition is its bigger brother, the Q70R. And my advice would be go buy the Q70R. It's got a fifty zone local dimming uh, full array backlight um, it's about 800 nits when it comes to HDR so it is a step up uh, in terms of TV right uh, that's me done um, oh, so that for you Phil was a magnificent sprint. well there's the two reviews are up there already so people can go and, go and read them the Q60 will be up probably on Tuesday um, I finished it it just needs to be proofed and go up and um, and then we're moving on to Editor's Choice so our Editor's Choice Awards uh, are coming up this month so people if you keep an eye on the homepage we have TVs, projectors, home AV and hi-fi 
to get through. Uh, and it's all our choices of best products of the year. The only caveat to that is it has to be products that we have tested and seen in person. So uh, these are uh, products that we have reviewed in the last uh, 12 months. Um, and it's our, our best of. So there may be some products that uh, are not there and you're wondering why. That's probably the reason why. If it's a good product, yeah, we haven't mentioned it. It's probably because we ain't reviewed it yet. Um, and it's up to manufacturers to get the stuff through in time as well. We've got deadlines and all the rest of it. So anyway, that's all coming up. We're going to talk gaming because we've got Mark on the podcast. Um, yeah, first time he's been around for a, a little while. And um, I'm trying to remember what we spoke about the last time. All right. Okay. In my best acting. Wasn't it the rumoured specs for the PS5? I, I believe it might have been, Mark. I believe it might have been. Oh. Um, so anyway, where is the gaming industry in 2019? Um, you know, Has it met expectations? We've got new technology now. HDR is now a thing with games. Um, and and it's, it, I believe it has been getting better. I believe that the first few titles that have come out, they, they were cheating a little bit and just expanding the, the, the brightness and actually adding high dynamic range to the games uh which were a little bit naughty so where are we with things mark um in 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 general uh hdr is is better than it once was but it, there are still kind of um still issues with the games it's it's not always the kind of doesn't always feel like the full fat variety like there are you know kind of cheats involved still on certain titles um right now i think everyone's just getting to the stage of the, the end of a generation and kind of starting to look towards the next consoles and kind of where we're going from there. So where are we going then with the, with the next consoles? <laughs> with the next consoles, I it, I think a lot of people kind of hoped that we might be getting stuff like um, variable refresh rate, that kind of thing, um, which would obviously have a massive impact on, you know, um, problems with frame rates. Um, but obviously that's got to link in with... Um, display technology and so therefore you've got to create a box that's going to work for you know the next kind of six seven years maybe so um yeah uh holiday time next year obviously we'll be getting the new consoles but it, it seems like you know gaming industry continues to go from strength to strength they reckon it's going to be worth about 200 billion a year by 2022 um the only minor kind of fly in the ointment recently has been um China's crackdown on kind of gaming addiction and the like, which has unsurprisingly slowed things given the, you know, if you've got 1.3 billion people and, you know, this kind of booming middle class with disposable income, then everyone's rushing to try and get those kind of, you know, many people involved um, wanted to play mobile games, tablet games, which right now is, is accounting for about 50% of the market. And so you're getting, you know, the whales, so to speak, who are, are spending huge amounts on microtransactions and stuff like that. Right. So this is this was going to be my next question. You know, how is it split? Because, um, you know, it's well it's, it's overtaken movies in terms of income. You know, it's one of, it's it's the biggest uh, entertainment business on the planet so is that well, is it that much is it that much further ahead than movies it has recently surpassed movies it was it was a big news story a few months ago which is obviously why i'm asking the question yeah. questions now but is that mobile that's driving that rather than console gaming because i don't think there's that many people console gaming really is there well, yeah. Um, funnily enough, console gaming is actually one of the areas that's continuing to grow. Which okay. uh, I'm wrong. Uh, no, no. I I thought exactly the same as you, to be honest. Which was that you know the main area of growth would be mobile gaming. However, obviously, you know, with things like kind of China's crackdown on gaming addiction, and and they've just come out with these gaming curfews for minors. Um, you know, that's that slowed it slightly. But yeah, no, console growth has been good. Um, Particularly, I mean, you look at the the sales numbers. PS4 is hit 100 million. Now, if you consider that, you know, the Wii was this kind of great phenomenon, and that was about 100 million as well, same as the original PlayStation. So it's it's kind of quietly gone under the radar. The PS4 has kind of you know firmly reestablished things. Um, I think also you've got the the fact that you've got you know this huge market for esports these days, and also the way in which people kind of interact with gaming with things like twitch and, and streaming it's it's kind of it's it's reinvigorated that market and so it's, you know there's perhaps an immediacy to gaming that, mark what's yeah. twitch i see it occasionally mentioned on 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 twitter and it's like i don't understand what that is 
it's a thing for people to stream what they're doing to other people who can watch. And so a lot of people like to play games and then they'll, they'll stream it. And so other people are watching someone playing games and it, you know, it links in with things like esports and, and, you know, various, these kind of MOBA games and the like. And so it's kind of massive uh, online kind of battle arena games. And so it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's massive business these days. It, it does make you feel, you know, a little bit like you, Ed, I, I was kind of, well, what are these things? You know, <laughs> it kind of slides past you. But yeah, you don't realise just how huge it is. I mean, even I suppose it's just the the kind of nature of these like online personalities just seen today about this, you know, YouTubers boxing match on, and that pops up on the BBC's news site and the like. So it's 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 a whole new world, isn't it? Yeah, I, I just it hope that is. somewhere somewhere on there is a man side, and it will be a man. This is <laughs> silently playing an Amiga port of Transport Tycoon. No commentary, no nothing. Just very yeah. slowly building a railway. There genuinely <laughs> will be because even stuff like um, with the, they love like the train simulators and stuff like that. In Japan, <laughs> and there will be someone watching that. That's that's the thing, you know. And I guess in a way, it, it it kind of ties into where gaming manages to kind of expand in a way that movies don't because, like. Movies, it's not just obviously about the box office return, but the whole enter- home entertainment kind of revenue. And games have been overtaking that. But you, you've got this kind of whole area where you, you can come, you've got DLC, you've got like loot boxes. Now, the question marks about whether that kind of thing is gambling or not, microtransactions, and just the whole experience can kind of be expanded in a way that kind of films and more passive entertainment can't be. And also you're getting kind of um, the way in which they get feedback. If you consider how, you know, often films will get feedback, it's it's still largely kind of like focus groups and, and questionnaires and the like at the end of showing someone something. Whereas you've got this kind of whole new wave of analytics that's, that's kind of tied into gaming to keep people playing. You know, it, it's slightly slightly kind of insidious in in a way but it you know creating this like virtual skinner box environment where you are getting people addicted to it but the immediacy of being able to kind of tailor that experience is something that's very very much kind of unique to gaming fair enough i mean to be fair um uh we talk about the funny simulators my son does appear to love microsoft farming simulator um, I don't know what that says about him or me as a parent, but he does genuinely seem to enjoy it. So um, it, there's no violence there. I mean, he does roll the tractors over a lot, but oh, yeah. for the most part, <laughs> he seems, seems quite happy. And um, it's it's better than playing GTA V. So, you know, fair enough. Yeah. And are, we still, uh, are we still moving towards a VR future then? Um, I don't, maybe we're in it already, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that, that's feels, actually a theory, isn't it? There's it a theory like that if a society was to develop a virtual reality indistinguishable from reality, then the chances are we are currently in it. Yeah. Because the odds of us being in the real world are, in, are minuscule compared to the likelihood of us being in a virtual one. Can I just say, if that's the case, where is my DLC or loot box to slightly upgrade where <laughs> I find myself right now? That's your car. Uh, yeah, I, I I can't help but think that I don't know. Uh, well, I suppose no. It could, if the, if they if it's the rules of the matrix, it couldn't be utopia. Yeah, they have to make it a bit crap, otherwise you you smell around and think something's not quite right. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray! So we're saying that this podcast is proof that we're living in a virtual reality because it's a bit crap. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's soul destroying. This is unnecessarily deep, and I haven't drunk enough for this to make any sense. I've got to say one last thing, though, on where games are going, which is one of the nice things we've seen in recent years is this kind of slight return back towards single player experiences. Mm. Because for a long time, I mean, in in the next uh, week, I think it'll be Jedi Fallen Order is going to come out, which people since Knights of the Old Republic have been screaming uh, desperate for a single player Star Wars game. And it seemed like every kind of business mind in the world was saying no the money is in you know mmos the money is in multiplayer gaming the money is however finally we are going to get a single player star wars game and this generation actually has been very very good for single player games it seems like we've had that uh the the latest god of war the spider-man 
one was also yep. uh, another marquee example of that. It does appear that it, it, it the, the suggestions that it was dead mainly came from doing it really badly, whereas it, it's clear fundamentally there are times when even the most social of human beings doesn't want to be operating in a social sense. So it, it, it's okay if it's done properly. Of course, it's going to sell. I would kill for a Star Wars VR game where you could fly down the Death, Death Star trench and fly up snow speed around Hoth and Walkers and do the speeder bike chase through the forest of Endor. I mean, all that stuff. It just seems to be crying out for it. But all we've got is the brief um, VR uh, game where you fly an X-wing, which is cool. But it's you know it's basically an offshoot of Rogue One. I would love it if someone put all the effort in for Steve and then just did the uh, Endor level that it was so hard he just smacked into a tree every ten <laughs> seconds. <laughs> just that's, 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 my, that's my problem with games. I just die too quickly. I'm not fast enough. I don't have the reflexes, and that's on the beginner's level. Can I recommend um, Transport Tycoon? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, so we thought it'd be interesting because Mark's into your game and stuff to see where things are. Um, and, you know, it's it's bringing in huge incomes at the minute. And like I say, it's overtaking Hollywood. So, um, But then Hollywood are, are just le- resting on their laurels, aren't they? Really? Or getting bought by Disney. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, there is that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, we'll be back with some film stuff in a sec. Right, so uh, moving on to movie section, uh, we're, we're going to review a cinema release. Um, like I say, we've changed the way we do this now, so we move it to the end of the of the podcast, so we can be a little bit more spoiler uh, with the with the film review. Um, uh, we, we probably didn't have to do that this way around because midway is the film, and uh, if you know anything about your history, you, you'll you'll know what's so. But it's a Roland Emmerich film, so we, what we're going to do is. We're going we're to play a game and see how many, because I think I'm the only one that's seen it so far. So we'll see if uh, the podcast crew can can uh, guess how the film goes. But before that, film's opening this week. Cars last Christmas, really? Yeah, no. I know, uh, it's quite cute in the trailers. Paul Feig. So did he do the last Ghostbusters yes, remake? Did. Okay, so well, there you go. Um, Emma Thompson, Madison Ingoldsby, and Boris Izakovich. Well, I mean, Amelia Clark's the lead. Oh, have we got Amelia <laughs> Clark Henry, in there? Henry Golding are the two main characters, and Emma Thompson plays Amelia Clark's mum, and Emma Thompson also wrote it. Well, that's handy. I was just reading from the sheet. Basically, it's a Christmas movie to the music of George Michael. That's the title might suggest. You know altogether too much about this. I film. saw the trailer. I saw the trailers. Um, Which is uh, bad yeah. enough. But yeah, you know all together. Oh, I, I like a Christmas-based rom-com. I, I could mm-hmm. be up for that. Mm-hmm. Seems a bit early though. It's not Christmas yet. Why are they releasing it in the beginning of November? Because they're going to struggle to make anything back on it. So you might as well start as early as you humanly can. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then the the one I know that Ed's probably going to make an effort. Yes, to go even and... <laughs> I will drag my ass to the so, cinema. Uh, so they've had to change. They've changed. No. The original title was Ford v Ferrari, and I understand the US that title it title is still is Ford versus Ferrari because yes, you don't know I, what Le Mans as I, is. As I understand so. it, its working title was this, and right. it, it it's because um, of a slight misunderstanding of of the nature of Le Mans in certain markets, and not. And I need I need to be clear. Uh, although it's still carrying Ford versus Ferrari in um, America, I believe it's some of the more far eastern markets where it has no meaning at all. So um, yeah, it, it, it's but no, Le Mans sixty six makes rather more sense about w- what it actually is. Yeah. So there was an extended trailer uh, for this uh, before Midway um, with some new bits and pieces in there. Looks really good. I'm going to go along and see it. And uh, and I, I actually had my Shelby um, top on when I was in the cinema <laughs> in the trailer and after the trailer the guy sitting about three seats away turned around to me and says you'll be going to see that one then are you? <laughs> <laughs> it does look really good I, I have to say I, I, I'm, I, the cynical jokester in me would like to say that the reason why they changed the title is because Americans got confused about where the 65 previous films were <laughs> but uh but yeah, didn't they do that for like Richard the Third or something? They, they did that for yes. the Madness, the Madness King of King George. George. Yeah. yeah. 
There you go. Yeah. So it, if anybody doesn't know what it is, it's the true life story, Carl Shelby uh, and Ford. Uh, the, the story was that Ford, I think Ferrari were in trouble, so Ford offered to buy Ferrari. And then Ferrari... It came right to the... Yeah. The, the, the contracts existed for them yeah. to do so. Yeah. And at the last minute, Ferrari pulled out and Ford was really annoyed. And um, it got back to him as well that um, <laughs> Enzo hadn't been too kind. Um, about his character and so on, uh, at which point um, they decided they were going to take them on. Um, and it wasn't until 66 that they managed to do that. They had attempted, I think, two years previous, uh, yes. but it wasn't until they brought Carl Shelby in. Oh, spoilers, in spoilers. Ken Mills. <laughs> well, this is, it's not spoilers, it's history, Steve. <laughs> yeah, but if you don't know the history, then it's spoilers. Uh, well, but anyway. I'd be, be staggered if they didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's it's the story of how we got there, and um, yeah, it looks really good, and and of course the cast's brilliant as well. So it has to be said, what raises this in the same way that Rush was quite watchable despite being you know glib was that if you if you bring enough reasonable actors and actresses in, then it has it has scope to you know it, it it should be able to should be able to work, which I suspect is something that we may come on to with uh, Midway. But um, <laughs> nevertheless, I will. Uh, I have seen it's just, just seen it's two and a half hours long, which seems quite. You know, I'm surprised most, to go for the full stuff twenty-four. Is, most stuff is these days, Ed. But uh, no, I, I I'm up for it. It looks, it looks quite good, and I say Matt Matt Damon. He gets a gets Matt some flack every now. Yes, exactly that. He gets some <laughs> flack, but nevertheless, most of the things I've watched Matt Damon, it has been very watchable. And you know, pr- provided that Christian Bale's not having too much of a really, really wants to be Daniel Day Lewis method acting moment, he'll be fine. Good stuff. Right, are we going to move on to discs released this week, guys? Sure. So this week is uh, a decent selection of 4K discs, actually. We got um, the Daniel Craig 4K Bond collection. It's not the collection, is it? Because there's another one. But anyway, uh, the ones so far, Skyfall, Spectre, Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace. Um, We've uh, also got Leon. Now I should point out that this is just the director's cut, which was a bit of a surprise to me. So... Traditionally, in the UK, we've had just the theatrical cut, and more recently on Blu-ray, we've had both. Now, really curiously, we've never had a 4K release in the UK for Leon. Two years after After the the US US 4K release, which had both, by seamless branching, we've managed to get a 4K release of Leon with Dolby Vision, but it's only the director's cut, which I happen to think is a bit disappointing. Uh, so I, I don't really know how that came about. I can only imagine it's probably cost. It was probably costs and licensing or, or something like that, and or they've made the decision. The studio we can do one. Yeah, yeah, it just seems an odd choice. But anyway, this is this Studio Canal, and they've they've done a tremendous job with all their other, you know, 4K Dolby Vision remasters. So I don't really know where Would this. You came rather from. watch the director's cut, anyways. What, what does it make? Personally, it? I would, but I mean, if you there's loads of feedback on the forum, there are loads of people who prefer the theatrical. I don't know why, but there are loads of people who do. So uh, what I'm frustrated by is that the lack of choice it doesn't make any sense. Two years after it was available, has it been out two years? Because I haven't opened, the, I haven't taken the plastic wrapping off my. Yes, <laughs> US, US release was. You were too, too busy watching Men in Black International, but yeah, yeah I know. I need to get around to watching that disc at some point. Um, so we got that. We got Spider Man Far From Home on 4K as well. I should also mention because I'm guessing we're not going to go back and review these, but the Daniel Craig Bond collection is is quite an interesting mixed bag because two of them are 2K upscales. And I don't think they necessarily bring a huge amount to the table. All four have four K, uh, Dolby Vision, uh, which does make a difference. So that that is going to give you an upgrade. Uh, the last two, Skyfall and Spectre, are the ones that were native 4K. Uh, Skyfall is easily the best. Shot digitally. Roger Deakins. <laughs> what more can you say? It one, looks, of the, one of the best looking Bonds ever. Yeah, actually. it is. Of, of all time. It's, I mean, it's spectacular. Um, Spectre is, went for back to film. And I, uh, although it's native 4K, I don't think it looks as good as Skyfall. And not just because it doesn't have that cinematography. Um, but the, those are, well, those the, are the two standouts. Soundtracks are the same as before. 
which oh, is then you can use that moss. Nope. Pretty sure the theatrical releases had had that more at least the last two. I just don't think they. I, I, I can't. I, I guess they're just testing the waters for a full Bond release. But uh, I, I mean, we complain about it. The re- reality is, the, these are tremendous soundtracks already. I mean, they are really, really good. But sure, they don't have Atmos, but they are. It's not like it's not like they were in desperate need of remixing. Uh, their demo no, soundtracks. But- it's just a bit surprising in this day and age that when you come across a 4K release, a, a, a mainstream 4K release that doesn't have it. I've never seen Quantum of Solace. Don't bother. You're not missing anything. No. <laughs> hang, on a, hang on a second. See, I found this really interesting because I agree with that, but I watch them back to back and it makes for a really good like fourth act to Casino Royale, like an action finale that you'd expect from a Bond film because Casino Royale didn't have that. It was almost a downbeat ending. Mm. So, Quantum of Solace is just one big action scene. The problem with Quantum of Solace is the action is not very well edited. It's it's too, yeah, too it's choppy, and too cuts too quick. I, I found it horrendous at the cinema, but at home I found it really good. It was fine. I mean, we've had so many Bourne films since. Maybe I'm used to it. <laughs> maybe maybe you're now jump cutted into just blind. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the yeah. the only one I enjoyed all of them, but the only one I just I just found really uh, an arduous task getting through was Spectre. I don't think I've not seen that either. It was just painful watching them try and try and fit back over the last four films some in, insane plan that would in, have involved Bond surviving everything in all of the other films just so he could meet this guy with no socks who would tell him that he was once kind of his adopted brother and he was miffed that he got better treatment by daddy. Yeah, you know, it was just such a really badly conceived tying in of them which is probably why I forgive Quantum of Solace a bit more because that was retrofitted they did Casino Royale and then they went no let's finish the story in Casino Royale and they actually tied them together really well and then they went Inspector let's tie them all together because that'll be a really fun task and they screwed it up so uh, yeah that's phenomenally bad but I don't see how they're getting another one I don't understand how no time well, given that Craig seemed to be phoning it in Inspector anyway. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, but I don't see where the story goes. I mean, he, he pretty much he did, did the Dirty Harry, I'll fling my badge at the end kind of style finale, walk off into the distance with the girl. That's, that's the end of his story, isn't it? Well, unless they on Her Majesty's Secret Service it, which I won't mind because I hated the Bond girl in the last one, uh, I don't see where they're going to go. Well, yeah, talking about him being married in the new one. And someone was saying, like, uh, it's going to be a big change for Bond. He's going to be married. I thought, well, have you not seen on the Majesty's yeah, Secret yeah. Service? Because he's already been married once before. <laughs> that is the only reason why they marry him. Anyway, we'll see whether that happens. Um, on Blu-ray, Spider-Man Far From Home is getting Blu-ray releases uh, as well as 4K. Have you, have you actually listened to Spider-Man Far From Home yet? Because the soundtrack was one of those annoying, which bizarrely for Sony. So, you know, it, I've heard a lot, lot of this. Do, do you have the US disc? Yeah. Because I got the UK disc, I got no complaints. Uh-huh. In fact, it shook the whole room and scared the family. So <laughs> I, I actually thought it was tremendous. And then afterwards, when I was writing up the review, which will probably be published by the time this is out, but when I was writing up the review, I read that people were complaining about the soundtrack, and I was like, well, what soundtrack? So I thought it was tremendous. I don't know I don't know whether there's a difference between the discs, but I thought it was tremendous. Proper bass. It's Sony still, isn't it? It's not like it's a different studio. Yeah, any, any, anyway, I didn't have any complaints about that. Like, right from the rock uh, monster thingy right at the beginning, that's when it, it boomed. And Isn't that it... a B-52 song? Oh, no, it's Rock Lobster, sorry, <laughs> as you were. Rock Monster is, uh, isn't that a Blur song? Maybe. So, we also got <laughs> Peaky Blinders Season 5 on Blu-ray and Big Bang Final Season on Blu-ray. And then Hooray. The Man in the High Castle Season 4, I think it's the final one on Amazon. And The Crown Season 3 on Netflix. And you've got a whole and bunch what? of stuff on Apple TV+. Plus. I can't do you any favours on that one. You've already told me. I, I've um, I've watched, or I've started, because Apple TV uh, Plus isn't putting it all out in one hit, like Netflix or Amazon to a certain extent. Um, they're drip feeding. So the first three episodes were released on launch day, and then they've been adding an episode a week to their main shows. So there's uh, Jason Momer's C. C. Is that good? Yeah, that's. Uh, I don't have much that yet. I, I've got to say the concept is a bit silly. It's basically the future where mankind's lost its sight, 
and then some kids are born who can see. But we wouldn't survive very long if we went blind, would we? <laughs> I think, I think well, that's I mean, have you seen concept. Book of Eli? Because Denzel Washington. Yeah, that, that's one yeah. guy though. One guy, not the entire and he species. Is, he is Denzel Washington. Yes, so. quite. Um, I haven't seen that yet, so I will give it a go. Um, what I will say is because uh, I have watched. Uh, for All Mankind, which is the new series by Ronald D. Moore, which basically takes the concept that Russia beats America to the moon in 69 by two months and the space race doesn't end. So all the things that NASA were planning, going to Mars, moon bases, this, this all happens. Um, and uh, I'm loving that. Brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Uh, mixes real people, you know, real characters with um, with um, fictional characters. The, the, they're chucking money at these series. They're all Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos, and they look bloody expensive. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, that that series alone is enough for me to to get the you know the service for a year at least and just check it out. Um, I haven't tried things like the morning show yet, which just hasn't been getting good reviews, um, but I will at some point. But uh, for for all mankind alone is a good enough reason to get. The that series. sounds really good. So I've basically, what watching... you're, so basically, what you're telling us, Steve, is you got Apple TV Plus and you've watched one thing on it. I've watched one seat, well, yeah. four episodes on it so far. Well, to be honest, it sounds really good. I've seen, I've seen Mars. Well, I've only got so much time. It's only been a week. <laughs> I've seen Mars on Netflix because yeah, that starts actually... again on Tuesday. But that yeah, starts but... again on Tuesday. Yeah, but I don't know whether is it is it a Netflix debut or is it just that it's no, it's, added... a, it's made by somebody else and they'll be showing it each week. Right. It's not a Netflix and... series. So, so I I watched the first season again and I I. It, it reminds me of what you're talking about in the space race because it, it, it mentions how um, Nixon had the choice between building the shuttle or going to Mars. And he went for building the shuttle because he wasn't really interested in spending a great deal of money on space anymore. So he wanted to do stuff where they could just test it out and see how they go. They didn't want another big program to try and get to another planet. And, um, and it set back the Mars mission for decades so it would have been interesting if, even if the the Russians hadn't beat us, if that decision had been different. You know, in a Watchman world, if uh, if they'd gone down like a different route there. President Bedford. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then and we ended up in Mars because it is interesting that he just went. Oh, no, I can't no, but be- that was all part of the plan. I mean, NASA's plan was you know, lose um, moon landings, extended stays on the moon, moon base mission to mars that was the whole point um and of course all that got canned in 69 once they landed on the moon and beat the russians nixon pulled the funding and obviously they needed to, they were still fighting vietnam in this version of events they cut vietnam short they basically do a peace treaty in 1970 in order to funnel more money into nasa to, to um get ahead of the russians again it's really good it's a really good series and i'm really enjoying it so if you're a nasa geek you'll love it <laughs> and as i say it looks it looks the business too I wonder what the end of Moonraker would have been without the shuttle. <laughs> I, I, don't think it would have been a, I don't think it would have been any less shit. In Moonraker, though. they bring out the American doing? Space Force, um, and they've got one now. <laughs> Those space <laughs> marines suddenly popped up out of nowhere. So I guess, uh, I guess, I think Trump may have seen Moonraker, and that's where he got the idea. <laughs> What's he doing? I believe he's uh, attempting re-entry, sir. <laughs> oh, gosh. Just stop. I've repressed all of them. One of the best more. Bond girl names, too, Holly Goodhead. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's really it's it's only one step removed from Austin Powers's a lot of vagina. I love I absolutely love Moonraker. I got all the time in the world for that. It's so, it, it, so well it's, top, it has right? aged well, but I loved it when I saw it as a kid. Right, can we try and do this in under two hours? <laughs> Please, I haven't eaten yet. I'm hungry. <laughs> right, well, well, we'll be quick with uh, with our movie review this week. So, uh, movie review this week is Midway. Um, right, so it's a it's a Roland Emmerich film. Um, so everybody gets one guess uh, in into this one to see where things go. So I'll I'll kick it off. Right, one dimensional characters. Uh, yeah. you, you know that that's going to be the case he doesn't take any time to develop his characters in any way whatsoever um, you basically you might get to know their name and uh, one motivation from each right so what else do you think happens Ed? Uh, I think that there will be a weird love interest secondary despite the fact that it's wall to wall cock on most warships all the time Especially in 1940. Particularly in 1942. <laughs> okay. Um, and I would also... I'm also going with a uh, notable sacrifice from somebody somewhere at some point. Best friend. 
mentor. Yeah, Goose. So, along those lines, yeah. Steve? Well, given that it's Emmerich, he'll want to chuck in everything but the ch- kitchen sink, and having seen the trailer, I'm guessing we're going to get Pearl Harbor, The Doolittle Raid, and Midway all in one film. <laughs> Bang on the money. <laughs> How long do you think he spends on each? About five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, which, which is about which, an hour of really pointless plot that's got subtle to do with the main battle. Uh, n- not actually, it's wall wall action. It, it if, if, if there's one thing I'd, I'll, I'll give him on this one is that he hasn't even bothered to spend more than a minute on each character development. It's like, <laughs> yeah, just get in the plane. Is it plane <laughs> wall slightly ropey CG then? There, there's some ropey CG in there. The planes do look a little bit fake now and again. Um, one of the best. And I mean one of the best sound mixes I have heard in a long time in Atmos. It yeah, was, it is phenomenal. There's some of the dog fights. I was ducking because I thought the the bullets were going to take my head off. Um, Isn't this what Atmos was for? Really? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, okay, then Mark, what else do you think happens? Oh, well, Ed stole mine. I, I was going to go for the the heroic sacrifice. That's what I thought would have been key. Okay, so you you have to think of something else then. Uh, end on on a an Ancient overly aliens. simplistic patriotic ending. Okay, uh, is there pointless asked? villainy from the villains? I mean, just Definitely. pointless. No, no. Uh, are what, the bad guys. What, what what he tries to do? Are the um, Japanese all inscrutable? <laughs> <laughs> Makes a bloody good camera, though, don't they? What what he actually tries to do, right? Is he he tries to play it from each side so he sure. tries to give you an insight like kind of like what Clint Eastwood did really really well yeah um, let us be with Jima yeah like, exactly like Tora 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 kind of thing but he tries to he tries to do it in, in such a way that it just feels really um, cheap um, and, and actually maybe a bit dishonourable I don't know it's just it just it just doesn't sit right um, is there a lot of flag waving and big patriotic ending? Not, not too much. No, I mean, it, obviously, it's from the American point of view, obviously, um, but it, it it doesn't really. You can tell it's been a pet project of his. You can tell it's something that he's spent a lot of time in developing. But what he's been developing is all the CG and action, and isn't it, it wouldn't want to be cool to show this and, and isn't this going to be cool where you know the wing tips the water as it pulls out of a of a dive that'll be really good and I can do this effect and that effect and he completely forgets about actually telling the story uh, you know he doesn't have a Jack and Rose uh, you know <laughs> fictional characters to move the plot along or he doesn't even use the, the, the actual historical characters that are there I mean you get this thing at the end where they do it in all these films where they tell you where, you know what happened to each character through their career and all the rest of it but you get to the point and you think why couldn't you tell us more about the characters through the actual film <laughs> and this might have had a bit more resonance at the end um, because I think if it, was, if it had been done right you'd have been coming out with um uh, you know that that respect that he came out of saving Private Ryan with, you know, for for that generation. You know that generation had balls; they were brave and all the rest. Of it. it this feels like a, a popcorn take of a serious historical event that has cool CG and Sounds its like own effects. Then. Exactly, <laughs> absolutely. So you know, if you well, I suppose you don't really know, but I was going to say, does he at least keep it historically accurate? Because obviously, if you watch the Patriot, I mean, that's just despicable in terms of its historical inaccuracies and the things that they put in there that never happened during the American War of Independence. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's, a lot of this you're not going to be able to tell that now because a lot of the participants are no longer with us. In fact, none of them are with us anymore, are they? I'm sure so, Ed can tell if it's historically accurate. You wrote a whole paper on it. <laughs> I haven't no, I, I I haven't seen it. No, I, I have played. I had to play the uh, Midway uh, War Game at university. But um, I mean, it has to be said. Did you it must win or did been... the Japanese win? Japanese won, obviously. As I've said, we said this in the podcast Every time, a couple of weeks ago. It's, 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 uh, you li- it's the equivalent of rolling six after six after six after six. It, it's it's impossible to overstate just how unlikely. Uh, many aspects of Midway are. But equally, in terms of just, just pure CGI, 
I am intrigued because one of the aircraft carriers that was hit, the Carga, um, it had. What was it? It, it? It's all obviously all sort of a bit hit and miss as to exactly what blew up at what time. But there were a hundred five hundred kilogram bombs on the hangar deck at the time that the dive bombers attacked and they didn't all go off at once as you might expect but they all went off within a reasonably short space of time and it was just ridiculous in terms of the the, the sheer i mean the levels of carnage it created so i mean that the scope to making things look spectacular on screen i don't doubt that it's you know you don't have to do any deviation from from historical realism to make to make it look good i, I at the very least i hope it does that but yeah it, it does i mean technically as, as a piece of filmmaking as you would expect it's it's absolutely you know, fantastic. The editing's really good. Um, it's a long movie, but I didn't feel it. You know, I didn't look at my watch at any point. Um, basically because he doesn't spend any time with it, those long <laughs> character development moments, you know what I mean? It's, uh, like I say, it's wall-to-wall, just get to the next... Explosions. Get to the next All explosion. Thriller, you know no I mean? filler. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I... I, I, I Did you come he, away from it, Phil, thinking the Americans massively lucked out in that battle? No. No, that's well, that, that, okay, that's right. So <laughs> that's not that's not that's not correct. The Americans did. The Amer- don't please don't misconstrue this. The Pacific War was a foregone conclusion, but just how lucky the Americans got at the Battle of Midway. Even the Americans made no bones about it. The U.S. Navy points out if that, if the Japanese had sunk the American carrier fleet or the carriers that were in the Pacific as they planned to do, it would have. Not, not by America, two, but it two, would certainly two, years, have two more back, years, and it would have given the Japanese free reign across uh, across the Pacific, basically, for a period of time. And it would have taken a couple of years, yeah, wouldn't it, to build more carriers? So, yeah, um, um, yeah I mean, America was lucky. They were lucky that the carrier fleet was the carriers weren't at Pearl Harbor, <laughs> so they didn't get hit, and then they were lucky at Midway. Um, or oh, we were all lucky, really, not just the Americans, obviously, as yeah, so. a as the as the allies, it was mm. it was very lucky because it, it it reduced it. Yes, you, it, I don't think it would have made any difference to the long term conclusion. I think America still would have beaten Japan because it was just a massive country, uh, and they made a massive mistake attacking them. But um, it would have extended the war. No, unquestionably. The Pacific. But I mean, equally, this is uh, this is an interesting arrival because although would it in- actually Ed because of the atomic bomb obviously could have made a massive difference no because you still needed a delivery system yeah you need and to get close you, enough you needed to have got close enough to do that but um the fact this film has been made uh, even allowing for that uh pacific miniseries on hbo hacksaw ridge uh it is still a massively underexplored. there is a film of midway made in 76 and it, very you, good it is too well no because they kept cutting to um Stock footage, you know, they from, did, from, the, but from the documentary never, by John Ford of the Battle of Midway, which is really good. I, I, I John actually, Ford, I, I quite enjoyed that. Uh, I thought, yeah. Oh, good. Oh, he was there. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he didn't realise he was going to be at the most one of the most important battles of World War Two, but <laughs> he was there to document it. But, um, but no, I mean, obviously, Guadalcanal has featured in the incredibly shit thin, thin red, red line. line. <laughs> um. But whoa, you... whoa, 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 whoa. No, I we've know. had this argument. I... We've had this argument before, no. Kaz. Is it's this one the, of the same alternate reality that you and Steve were talking about where they, the other people won the war? No, no, this no, no, this I'm alternate stop. reality where... Com- I like it too, Kaz. Battle. I like it too. Compared well, to some naval of the... gazing. <laughs> oh, compared to some of the, ac- it. the actualities oh. of the Guadalcanal campaign, it's just... a. You know, yeah, just what, a, watch a, the Pacific if you want to see a proper rendition of the Guadalcanal abs- campaign. An absolute circle jerk of a film. I mean, I, if someone could make a proper film it, that involved things, I mean, the first naval battle of Guadalcanal. If you read the bold statistics of the ranges that some of the ships were fighting at, and then portrayed that on film, you'd assume that Michael Bay had clubbed the director over the back of the head and just made the film himself because they're so. It's so improbably violent. It would be an extraordinary thing to do. And instead, we've got Terence Mallet doing a tone poem, and he can just f*** the f*** off. But, I mean, it's the same with Apocalypse Now, isn't it? It's like saying Apocalypse Now wasn't a realistic depiction of Vietnam War. 
it's, I think a podcast now was a realistic depiction of the Vietnam <laughs> no, War. You actually. see what I mean? It's not. It's not in the same. It doesn't show the same sc- yeah, if, scale if the of critic- the Vietnam War as, as say, Platoon. Even it's not an argument that it, it, it's not like we can unmake the thin red line. Regrettably, um, I'm just saying that there's an a Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands campaign has an awful lot more to give. The uh, landing on Tarawa, you just doing trying to do justice to the savagery of uh, a conflict fought on uh, an island which is about the same size as the town I currently live in, actually slightly smaller. Um, I don't mean Milton Keynes. They, they, they pack- cover that in in the Pacific. The Doctor they do, people. but again, there's there's more. These things have more to give. I mean, the Pacific does it pretty well, but it's still done it at certainly a, delivers a, the savagery of the. Pacific. It's done at a serialized television level. There's still there's still more to be had out of these things. And considering we're remaking so many other things over and over again, I just think there's there's more to be had. Mm. But if the criticism of Midway as a film is it or at least one of the valid criticisms is that it doesn't go into the human aspect as much, then at the other end of the spectrum, can you not just accept that the thin red line was about the human element and less about the battle itself? Yes, it's just, I just hated everyone in it. Yeah, but I, <laughs> I, wanted to see a, I wanted to see a film about the battle. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I, I get what you're saying. It, I, 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 it's more, I suspect specifically that there isn't I don't think a work of Terence Malick I've ever actually enjoyed so that's probably probably on a hiding to nothing there but it's it's also something I spent a lot of time at a university so it just annoyed me Roland Emmerich I mean I I just reviewed his Is it Emmerich uh, or Emmerich Emmerich Yeah uh, Roland Emmerich he I just reviewed his maybe his second film or his first one of his early oh, films Universal Soldier Yeah and I had a lot of fun with that it took me back to when I first yeah, I like mean, I mean, Inde- Independence Day is a load of load of rubbish, but I love it. It's great. Yes, it's yes. <laughs> there is a scene in this as well where, where where one of the characters gets up to make a speech, and I was just thinking, oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than a scene in it where they upload a computer virus using Windows OS. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, it was, it was no, actually, it was a Mac. It was a Mac. It was a Mac, wasn't it? It was a Mac. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, even aliens use Mac. No, they all use Unix. Well, I think that was the argument. Just as long as the aliens don't expect to get a free subscription out of their purchase, they'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and on that bombshell, <laughs> that's it for the podcast this week. My thanks to Ed Selly. Utter one more syllable and I'll have you killed. <laughs> Steve Withers. Arrogance and self-awareness seldom go hand in hand. Kaz Harlow. I've been able to detect an undercurrent of sarcasm in your voice. And Mark Butray. I miss the Cold War. Don't forget, you can... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmark avforums.com for latest views, news and video. Plus, why not leave us a five-star rating on iTunes, but only if you enjoyed the show. Also, head over and check out our YouTube channel for videos on the latest product launches and reviews. And while you're there, feel free to subscribe. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for listening. Remember, next week, it's the second part of our Calibration special, and we'll see you again after that. (laughs) 